the red horse of war, the seal of the red horse of war was being broken. And the red horse of conflict was coming first to take peace away from the people at a social level, an interpersonal level. Families were being divided, neighborhoods being divided, races are being divided, churches are being divided, and conflict is coming at all levels. Before it breaks out in world war, it's breaking out in conflict and in war at all levels of our society. And so too, within Israel and, and Palestinian areas, the current warfare that's broken out between Hamas and the Gaza area and between the Israeli military, and it's escalating. There's missiles being fired from Syria now. Missiles have been fired from Southern Lebanon, although it appears they did not originate with Hezbollah. All of this is escalating to a boiling pitch. And at the same time, I was telling my son who lives in North Carolina, and of course, North Carolina is abbreviated with the letters N-O. And I wrote him an email and I said, N-O Carolina now stands for no gas in Carolina. As gas shortages are emerging, water shortages are emerging, food shortages, the chip shortage is going to result in an interruption in automobile manufacturing. I mean, it's crazy how many crises are breaking out at the same time. Just tonight, we're getting emergency reports that FEMA is out ordering emergency massive quantities of bottled water to be shipped immediately to the Washington, D.C. area. And they are paying truckers exorbitant premiums to ship semi-trailers full of bottled water to the government. Why does the government suddenly need hundreds of thousands of bottles of water? What is about to happen that would require large quantities of bottled water? Is there going to be a disruption in electrical power? Are we going to have an EMP event? Is the grid about to go down? Is there a massive earthquake plant? Is there going to be another false flag? Who knows what's up? But we are nowhere near normal. And we are, the, the direction of the country is not even headed towards normal. We're headed to insanity. Israel calling up their military reserves. Forces in Gaza began deploying suicide drones a few days ago that were able to evade and attack the Israeli Iron Dome system because they fly so low. Well, if Israel cannot stop these drone attacks, their military could be decimated. They won't stand by and allow their military to be decimated. Israel will use whatever weapons are necessary to eliminate a threat to its survival. And they will go as far as the Samson option, which most people consider an unthinkable consideration. And the Samson option involves the use of weapons, massive weapons that would destroy entire cities. Israel is now facing a potential military situation where they may resort to a preemptive strike. And you know, that's unthinkable to Americans, but it's the actual Israeli military doctrine. If confronted with the, um, if confronted with the reality of a military defeat, on the battlefield in conventional forces, their doctrine of defense involves using their arsenal of atomic bombs. And you can see the entire Middle East incinerated. So we are, <laughs> we are on the verge of the world changing forever. Uh, this war is escalating faster it's fast and furious, and it's not slowing down. The fix is in. The economy is collapsing. Our economy is shuttering down. I mean, you start thinking through all the things that are in crisis, Frank. We've got an economic crisis as a result of the COVID lockdowns. Entire sections of the economy are, are not recovering. There is a, a dramatic breakdown in the normal supply chain. There's been a, such a disruption in key components that are produced and shipped from Asia that we do not have the shipping transport capacity to move the product that has been produced to try to resupply the necessary inventory in the middle and top tier producers in the West. They don't have the ability to move twice as much 
freight volume out of the ports of Asia. So there's no way to complete the resupply. The just-in-time inventory system was a system designed to totally collapse. And in fact, it has broken and it's not repairable anytime soon. And instead, the systemic breakdowns appear to be increasing. So the economy is shuddering. The dollar is at in serious risk. Producer prices in our country are exploding. Lumber up 400%. Food, corn, soybeans, 70% year-over-year changes. Iron ore, 110%. I mean, these are hyperinflationary levels. There's a panic occurring in real estate. People are panicking to get out of their dollars. They're panicking to get out of the cities, and they should be in, uh, I guess, a bit of a hurry. If you live in any of the major cities that are not going to fare well when this war comes to our shores, perhaps you should panic and get out. But, you know, all of these things are occurring simultaneously. And against this backdrop, we've got political crisis. We are a laughingstock of the world with our woke identity, seeming, seemingly the center stage of, of American political life. We've got the, the worst drought in, what, 40 to 50 years occurring in much of the United States. We've got collapsing water levels. <laughs> the list just goes on. We're facing a grand solar minimum. The oceans are dying. Fukushima is beginning to dump massive quantities of radioactive water into the oceans. The earthquakes are accelerating. Volcanoes are increasing at an exponential level. I mean, what's next? 100-pound hailstones? And wormwood striking the sea and the water's becoming as blood? Well, I'll tell you what's next. What's next is the red horse going to the stage of world war. And we're probably five, six months away from that. If that is correct, if, if my assessment, and and for the naysayers, I'm not a prophet. I'm not prophesying anything. I'm a military analyst. I'm a financial analyst. I'm a historian. And I'm a biblical student who's sharpened his pen to a level where I've been able to glean things from the scriptures. This judgment has come. The time is appointed. 70th year of Babylon has ended. And has not the world changed in the last 12 months? 14 months since March of 22, on March 22nd, 2020, a little over 14 months ago, our country was locked down for two weeks, if you remember, to flatten the curve. We need 60,000 ventilators here in New York immediately. We have to flatten the curve. Well, they're still flattening the curve, but they're not flattening the curve, they're flattening the people. They're flattening the republic replacing it with a communist system. And that process, that great reset work that they are engaged in is only half complete. But the Lord is going to interrupt their plans. They've opened Pandora's box and it's going to explode in their faces momentarily. Even the UN has warned a full-scale war appears to be in process of breaking out in the Middle East. Largest rocket barrage ever came out of Gaza in the last two days. It is simply unbelievable. And so, you know, in that context, these are the days of preparation. For the remnant, it is time to prepare. But if we refuse to repent at the hearing of his word, and if we refuse to obey at the wooing of his spirit, if we refuse to fast and pray, if we refuse to turn with all of our hearts, then the Lord will send the necessary persecution to break through our denial veil and to break through our hardened hearts and to cause us to repent utterly because the church is in captivity spiritually. Now, most Christians don't know that. They think they're free. They think they're, they've received the truth. They think that they know everything. They don't need to hear anything from another man, from another voice. And yet, where is the fruit of the Spirit? Where is the evidence of the power of God? These signs will follow those who truly believe and whose hearts are true towards me. 
is the essence of the Lord's promises at the end of the book of Mark. In my name, they will cast out devils. And in my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. They will drink poisons. It will have no effect on them. But there, are, there is no deliverance in the land. Prophet Isaiah, Isha'iah wrote, you know, the, we have not wrought any deliverance in the earth. Instead, the witches and the, and the Satanists came in and joined the churches. And what was a legitimate move of the Spirit of God in the early 1970s became corrupted by, by a satanic counterfeit spirit in the 80s and was subsumed by a totally false prophetic movement by the 90s. And most of the people had simply fallen away. And under the guise of, the, of leadership that knew nothing about the mandate of Scripture, in all these churches, people were told, let's all lay hands on each other. Let's all transfer the Spirit. But the Spirit that was transferred was not the Holy Spirit. The people all fell into slavery. First thing that happens in spiritual slavery is blindness and deafness. People became blind to their condition. And they became deaf to the hearing of the true word of God. While well, the Lord's about to speak to these people who refused to hear the reading of his word and they refused to hear his voice from heaven. So now the Lord is going to speak in a manner where everyone will hear him, even those who, whose ears are deaf. For the whirlwind of his judgment is about to begin. The flesh profited me nothing. It was only the spirit that gave life. It's the same for all of us. And the end of all flesh is coming quickly upon us, brothers and sisters. So don't even seek to save your comfortable life in the flesh. The master already told us the days of ease are ending soon. I'm calling all the fishes. If you're, a, if you're a fish that God's going to keep in his boat, then you need to get up and pray. The days of ease are ending soon. It's time to get up and pray. Because soon the nations will be hard-pressed, passing through the land, and they will fret themselves. They, they'll have no hope. Their gods are dead. Their fortunes will have failed them. The communist system they thought would give them free everything suddenly will be delivering nothing. And all there will be will be death and hardship, suffering and fear and nowhere to turn. And they will fret themselves and they will curse their king. Curse that Alzheimer guy, whatever he is. Those, those foolish people that led the nation to ruin. They will curse their leaders and they will curse their dead gods. Well, their gods cursed them, so I guess it's sort of full circle now. And they will look upward, and they will look onto the earth, and behold, only trouble and darkness, dimness and anguish. And they shall be driven into darkness. And that word for darkness literally means blackness, death, desolation. Listen, the party's over for the wicked. You know, they're, they're being told we're going to go back to normal. But normal is never coming back. What is coming is darkness. What is coming is the birth of the man-child. What is coming is the collapse of our economy, followed by the Great War, followed by the beginning of the second exodus, followed by the master sending his angels into the earth to gather all of his fishes together and to bring them together into his sanctuary and then to also gather together all of the, the dead and fruitless branches and to bundle them for burning. The disciples were told to wait in Jerusalem, to wait in the house of the Lord, to wait for the power from on high. And so, too, we, the disciples of Jesus at the end of the age, we too are waiting for the anointing that will break every yoke to come. And, and so we are to prepare our house 
We are to prepare our hearts in this time. This is a time for us to prepare every day our hearts for the visitation of our God. This is a day for us to prepare our temples as the living temple of God and to go before the brazen altar that burns in the heavens to appear by the Spirit of God through faith and through the Word of God to appear in prayer and in the fullness of the Holy Spirit in the presence of God to present our lives a living sacrifice, a burnt offering the altar that is in our hearts could be cleansed and purified by fire. And so we present our lives a living offering, a burnt offering upon the altar, and that the Lord would accept us and bring us into the holy place, which is the presence of God, the house of the Lord, which is the only place that will be protected in the time that is ahead. There's an anointing coming. Water, living water will be poured out from on high. And when that water hits our parched, burnt hearts, there'll be an explosion. And if we don't break, we too will be fit for the master's use. So what do we do, brothers and sisters? What do we do with these final days of Seven days from now will be in the final ten days when the disciples gathered in the upper room and they, they consecrated the time in prayer and fasting by the direct and express commandment of the king. Jesus told them, tarry not, do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave your prayer loft. Do not leave the presence of God until you receive the power from on high and you must begin fasting and praying in this time whether it's a daniel fast a full water fast do the do the distilled water fast mixing the beets the celery and the carrots using carrots three parts beets two parts celery one part organic and clean them and cut them into one ounce piece, pieces and put them in your large glass containers filled with distilled water and, and drink as much as you want over the days of your fasting and take a little teaspoon uh, to tablespoon of sugar after the second or third day and, and you'll be perfectly fine to fast and pray. You just can't do serious physical labor. But if you have to do physical labor, then do the Daniel fast. But everyone who calls themselves by the name of the Lord must now set their face to seek the Lord their God. What do we do? I, I literally, prayerfully, ask that of the Lord um, as I was working on this message. And the answer came forth. God spoke to me out of the writings of Daniel the prophet. And I'll read Daniel 9, verse 3. This is what we must now do. Set your face to seek the Lord your God by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And as you pray unto the Lord, make confession of your sin and your family's sin and your church's sin and your generational sin, and the nation's sin. And pray, you can pray as Daniel prayed, O Lord, the great and awesome God, the great and dreadful God, who keeps his covenant of mercy. Bless you, Lord. It's the reason that we're not consumed. It's the reason there is a remnant. He keeps the covenant of his mercy for those who love him. And to those that keep his commandments, well, most of us have failed on the latter, one way or another. You know, even unto this day, many of us are failing to keep all of his commandments. Well, we need to examine our hearts and we need to make a new start with the Lord. We need to put him first and our commitment to prayer needs to come first. And our, our dedication to the Lord needs to come first. For we have sinned and we've all committed iniquity. We've done wickedly. We've rebelled from, we've even departed from the precepts and from the judgments of the Lord. Nor have we hearkened unto his servants, the, the prophets, the messengers, the teachers that he sent, who, who came to us and spoke to us, to our kings and our princes and our fathers and to all the people of this land. 
We need to repent and we need to seek the Lord. And that word for seek is bakash and it means to strive after, to ask, to beg, to search out by any method, but it means specifically in worship and in prayer. It means to strive after. You need to strive after the Lord. It means to ask, to beg, to beseech, to desire, to inquire, to seek for by all available means. So if I were to give you an illustration, I'll give you two illustrations of of ways that you could seek for something. Let's say you lost a quarter somewhere and maybe it fell in the couch. It, It fell out of your pocket somewhere in your living room you think, well, you're going to look for this. You'll, you'll seek this quarter, no doubt. But you, you won't seek it by all available means. You might spend a minute or two and, and you'll know, sort of, well, shrug your shoulders and say, well, it was just a quarter. You know, forget about it. I got more important things to do. Then um, instead of losing a quarter, imagine you lost your youngest child at an amusement park. You're with your family, suddenly you turn around and your four-year-old daughter is gone. She's missing. Well, now you've lost something more valuable than a quarter. Uh, What would the normal response of a mother or a father be to the loss of their young toddler in a major public venue like an amusement park? That's how we need to seek the Lord. By all available means, with the total commitment of your heart, the total engagement of your soul, with all of your strength, all of your mind, all of your heart. And by prayer, the word is tefillah, and it means intercession, supplication, but it also means a hymn, a prayer that you sing. And the Lord made it very clear that people need to worship. There are many, many people that are praying. You guys are praying. That's good. But, but to, for many people, your prayers are filled with, with, with words of anxiety, words of fear. We need to take authority and bind that lying demon of fear and cast that out of you. Cast that out of your life. Get that out of your house. And, and you need to enter into the presence of God and, and the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. So part of the formula, part of the instruction here in Daniel 9 verse 4 is that you need to seek the Lord verse 3, with all of your might and with prayer. And that prayer includes worship and you need to sing. Now, some of us have better singing voices than others, but the, the process of worshiping God will still your heart. It will quiet your heart. And the presence of God inhabits the praises of his people. The presence of God will come the Holy Spirit will come and all of the fear and the anxious, anxious thoughts of the enemy will simply dissipate. All of the darkness will disappear. It'll flee from the light. Then you can begin to pray properly. And you can pray by supplications. Hallelujah. And the word for supplication is tachanun and it means earnest prayer. It's it's weeping prayer, travailing prayer. And if your prayer is not producing weeping, then it's because you haven't fasted and prayed enough. Your your times of fasting and praying need to become so consistent that you can break through the, the you know, McFly, you know, the thick head of the flash that has got all of us so confused, we need to get out of the mind of the flesh and we need to get into our spirit, the the heart that is in the spirit within us. We need to cry out from our spirit man. And believe me, as you transition from the mind of the flesh into the, the place of the spirit that is in you, your spirit man will begin to weep over the condition of the church, over the condition of all of our lives, over what's happening to our children and our families, and over what is about to come forth upon this land. And so with supplication, with earnest weeping prayer, we need to seek the face of our God, and with fasting, and the word is tsiom, and it literally means turn off the food. 
turn off the pleasant food. The Daniel fast was basically the vegan diet. Green leafy vegetables and fruits and nuts, no cookies, no cakes, no bread, no carbs whatsoever that were any kind of processed food. If it comes in a box, you're not eating it. Only things God made touch your mouth. And that fast is a powerful fast. You know, if you've got a hard job that requires a lot of physical energy, then you got to do the Daniel fast. Do it for three weeks. Start now. Start this weekend. And finish strong for another week or whatever. That Daniel fast will clear your mind with fasting and with sackcloth. And the word, this is, this is a hard one for you guys. The word for sackcloth in Hebrew is sack. That's right. That word that we have in English comes right out of Hebrew. Just like the word for charred or charcoal or charbroiled which means burnt to a crisp. That word char is also from Hebrew, and it means incinerated. It means burned utterly and destroyed. And what's about to happen is the country is going to be charred. America's about to get char-broiled, and it will be charred. It'll be turned into the residue of charcoal. And before this comes to pass in our land, we need to fast and we need to put on sackcloth. And it's the clothing of humility. It means to wear garments of mourning and humiliation. It literally was a bag. Sackcloth was like you get the potato bag out, you cut three holes in it, one for your head and two for your arms, and you, you wear a potato sack. And it's rough and it's uncomfortable and it's coarse. And it's used to represent times of mourning. It's a bag. It's for beggars. Well, your temple needs to be cleansed. If you want to become the living stones that God is going to use as part of his remnant, it's to follow all these admonitions of, of diligent prayer, seeking God like your life and the life of your family depends on it, and the supplications, earnest weeping prayer, fasting that is real, you know, not, face, not fasting from, you know, for fun. I'm fasting for joy, Benjamin. I fill my face with food every day. I've actually had pastors tell me that they've decided to fast for joy and feed the flesh. Okay. I mean, and these people teach. It's a scary thought to come into the hands and the judgment of Almighty God, having taught gross errors to the people. But so it is. The word for ashes is ephir, the ashes of a red heifer. It's the perfect sacrifice that cleanses and purifies our lives. It's placed on the head as a sign of humiliation and contrition and repentance from the heart. And it represents the brutal honesty that is required when you repent and confess your sins one to another. When your pride is reduced to ashes, it's the sign of true mourning and true grief, distress and sorrow to literally reduce your pride to ashes. Well, the people that won't humble themselves in this hour, their defenses are defenses of clay, and their homes and their lives are going to become ashes. These, and through these ashes, if they belong to the Lord, they'll, they'll be cleansed. They'll be changed. And the dead in Christ will rise first. But they will miss all of the glory. And the number for 666 in Hebrew is the same, Efer, only it's slightly different pronunciation, Fr, and it means a covering of ashes. And that's the final re remains. It's the final reward of all of the people who follow the beast and who were deceived by the red dragon. Their lives will be nothing more than ashes. Everything that they were, everything that they did, everything they accumulated for themselves will be utterly burned in the fire. All that will be left is parched, charred land covered in ashes. They themselves reduced to ashes. And their spirits in the lake of fire for eternity. Don't be one of them. Let's take a quick look at Revelation 12. So the dragon is, is full of wrath to destroy the son. Yet the child 
will be given a rod of iron, the authority of Jesus as judge of the entire earth. And then the child will be caught up unto God into his throne. And at that point, the great tribulation, the great second exodus will begin and the woman will flee into the wilderness where she will be given a place prepared by God. And when God prepares a place, it's a rather good place. The Lord thinks of everything. It's a place with green grass. It's a place with pure water. It's a place where manna will be fed to the people. It's high up in the mountains. The views are glorious. It's in the mountains of greater Israel. In the land that would be appointed unto Zion. And there the Lord has prepared a place for the remnant of his people. That they should be fed and comforted there for 1,260 days. For the time of the great tribulation. And then there was war in heaven. And the angels of God fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought along with all of his angels. But they could not prevail. Neither was there any place left for them in heaven. And so the great dragon now was cast down. Even as he had cast down the angelic beings that were deceived to follow him. And so the old serpent who we call the devil and Satan. Who deceives the whole world was cast down onto the earth. And his angels they were cast down with him. And a loud voice cried from the heavens, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his anointed. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God night and day. And our brethren and the people of God overcame the dragon by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony that they love not their lives unto the death. We've learned to refuse the evil and choose the good. So we turn off the pleasures of Babylon and we begin to fast and pray and we, and we humble ourselves before our God. Knowing to refuse the evil, we choose the good. As we learn to refuse the evil, we are allowing God to build a wall of protection around our lives. Because the whole land shall become briars and thorns. For fear of the wild beasts and for fear of the serpents. Because of thieves and robbers. The whole land shall be covered in briars and thorns. And men shall come with spears and arrows. Everyone carrying weapons in that day. For fear of the evil that is in the road. When the judgment comes, it will come quickly. Men that will ascribe to lies. Men that will stand in court and testify under oath and lie. We're commanded to bear not false witness one against another, yet this is a generation of false witnesses. And a false witness will not go unpunished, and a false witness shall be destroyed, and the word means death. The penalty for bearing false witness one of another is actually the penalty of of eternal death for all liars shall find their portion in the lake filled with fires associate yourselves gather together take counsel together the scripture says yet be broken in pieces all ye that are far gird yourself strengthen yourselves prepare your provisions prepare your your prepper paradise and gird yourself, yet ye shall be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, it will come to nothing. The counsel of the flesh will come to nothing. Speak the words of the flesh, but they will not stand. For God is with us. The words of men are worthless in this hour. The words of God we shall hide in our heart. The men of this world, the men of the flesh, they take counsel together speaking to one another words that are worthless, spoken by the children of pride, the sons that lied. The Lord spoke to me and said, and he spoke thus to me with a strong hand and with mighty power, and he instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, neither shall I fear 
their fear, nor be afraid. God is cautioning us against having a sinful heart filled with fear. Yet fear will be in the way of this people at this time. And fear is contagious. He whose heart is filled with fear will fail him in the hour that is coming. And he will cause many around him to fall. Deuteronomy 20 verse 8. And the officers shall speak further unto this people and shall say, What man is there that is here among us that is fearful and of faint heart? Let him go and return to his house. Let his brother's heart faint as well as his heart. You don't want to be with people filled with fear in the time that is coming. Let the fear of the Lord alone be our dread. The Lord himself in Revelation 21 verse 8 said unto us, But the fearful and the unbelieving, and fear is a form of unbelief. If we have full confidence in God, what can men do unto us but what the Lord allows? And if the Lord allows such a thing, it is for our good. Why should we fear the purging work of God in our lives? We are being prepared for an eternity with the King. If the Lord deems it necessary for us to suffer yet a little more, I do not count it worthy to be compared with the glory that is going to be revealed in us and with the exceeding immeasurable glory, the majesty of the King who is calling us to be his friends. Let us not fear what man could do unto us. Let us not be faint-hearted that we would not have to go home to our own house. For our houses are no doubt going to burn like every other house. We want to go forward with the Lord and we want to go into his house, which will be the only house standing at the end of this time of tribulation. But the fearful and the unbelieving, who are the abominable, and the murderers and whoremongers and all the Chaldeans, all of the sorcerers and every idolater and all liars. Notice the Lord makes a particularly clear expression. He didn't say all the fearful or all unbelieving or all murderers or all idolaters, but he made specific reference that all liars, all robbers, shall have the part, their part, will be found in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So therefore, do not fear their fear, nor be afraid. Hallelujah. And that word for fear is yared. It means to be frightened, to be made afraid, dreadful fear, fear of seeing terrible things. And that word for their fear is mara or mora. And it means a fear or a dread. That which ought to be feared. Terribleness. Absolute terror. It's the conquering wind of evil that's going to sweep through the nation like a broom. Like a sledge or a battle axe. America's a field of corn. She's about to be leveled. With a th sharp threshing instrument, a wind will come forth. Judgment of the Lord will be released. And the entire field of corn will be leveled to the ground. And so the people will become afraid. The word is aratz, and it means to be in awe, to be in dread, to be frightened, to be terrified, to shake terribly with dreadful fear. But the Lord says, do not be afraid of what these people shall soon fear. Fear is coming. This cannot be stopped. Overwhelming fear. Devastating fear. But you must choose this day who you will fear and whose words you will hear. The scripture goes on and admonishes us. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. For he shall be a sanctuary for his remnant. And I will wait upon the Lord who has hidden his face. 
He's sealed the testimony of the prophetic writers, and he's hidden the true meaning from the face of the people. The Lord himself has also sealed up the churches that have forsaken him. He's sealed them in, and he himself has left the building. Not only is the book sealed, but many people are already sealed unto destruction. If they would repent, this could change. But in many, their hearts are hardened. They are hardened in their ways. And so the Lord has sealed the book. He's sealed the meaning and the message. And he's hiding his face from his people. I will wait upon the Lord who is hiding his face from the whole house of Jacob, from all of his people. It's funny though. Well, maybe funny is the wrong word. It's rather odd almost an indescribable paradox that the majority of the people who claim to know the Lord don't seem to know that the Lord has left the building. Most people no longer walk or speak or can even pray in the anointing. How is this possible that the people of God know not that the Lord has hidden his face from them? Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given, we are for signs and wonders in Israel. We are from the Lord of hosts, who dwells in the mountains of Zion. In a time when Satan and his kingdom have been cast down to the earth, in a time when the abyss will be opened and all of the hindering power of God will be literally removed and the satanic will overtake the nations in the fullness of evil and the compromised believers will be purified in the fires the fires will yet burn again in the ovens in the, the death camps of the beast and yet a remnant of people will be preserved protected blessed it shall be very well with the remnant in that day and God is sending an army to save you he's sending out his army to save the little lambs whose hearts are perfected towards him and we want to be part of that little company we want to be the people whose hearts belong only to the Lord, that the Lord would no longer hide his face from us. So we will wait upon the Lord and we will look for him. We'll not look for another. We'll not look to men. We don't need another man to prophesy to us. You don't need another man or woman to speak to you the things that God would say directly to you. You will find them in your prayer closet. You will find them in the word of God. You'll find them spoken by the still small voices of the Lord, speaking in the wind. Now the word of God will be confirmed by other witnesses. But God will never give you direction in your life through the words of another. They will only be sent to confirm. So take this false prophetic movement and throw it in the garbage. Throw it in the burn pile. Should not a people seek their God? Why should the living turn to the dead? Why should the remnant turn to the false prophetic movement? Many false prophets will come in my name and deceive many, said the master. And the word is polis and it means the vast majority of them. So you can take this entire prophetic movement and write Ichabod all over it. To the law of God to the word of God and to the testimony of the prophets. If they speak not according to the true word of God, it is because there is no light in them. It's not a question of being a little right and a little wrong. You are either speaking with the light of God as an oracle, which is the requirement of this hour. In the book of Peter, we are told, if any man speak, let him speak as an oracle of God an infallible witness. If you come forward to teach in this hour of your own accord, you are really making 
in my opinion, a very foolish mistake. For the teachers will be subject to the greater judgment. This judgment is already going to be very difficult. Why would you want to make it harder on yourself? But some would come forward having chosen to become teachers of their own accord. I, I don't understand that. You, you get more grief than anything. and It's a lot of work and not a whole lot of encouragement, really. More likely, a whole lot of harassment and opposition is what comes your way. I don't know. Maybe if you're a false teacher, Satan doesn't throw that stuff in your path. Maybe, maybe... Yeah, the false prophets all confirm each other's words. What am I thinking? Okay, look, so the job of false prophet is maybe, it, you know, it's um, an easy job for a while. Maybe you get some cookies out of it, I guess. I don't know. But it ends rather poorly because the false prophets will soon be consumed out of the land. The people will no longer listen to them for the, all of their false teachings of peace and prosperity will have been uncovered and discovered as the frauds that they are. And so the people will pass through the land hard-pressed and hungry. A time of hunger, a time of oppression is coming. The days of ease are ending soon. And so the people shall be hard-pressed and they'll be under great stress. Their faces will appear as if on fire from the stress that is coming. And brothers and sisters, it's going to get really tough. I, I, I don't think I've ever pulled any punches on that accord. And whoever seeks to save their life shall lose it. So that's an ill-fated mission. You can abandon that right now. I think the reality is we should all assume that we are dead men walking or dead women walking. But if we die, we don't stay dead. And while we live, we live, we, we literally lose our lives for the sake of Jesus. There's no reason for us to seek our own ways anymore. Mine didn't turn out well. As, as much as they seemed so wise at the time, every one of my ways ended in, well, disaster, I guess, or just loss or sadness or barrenness, fruitlessness. So who are the justified? They are the ones that went on to be sanctified. And what does that mean? It means their lives are transformed. A new creation actually is born again in them. And they die daily. And yes, the most righteous of us continue to struggle. But we don't keep committing the same sins. God's peeling back the onion of the corrupt nature of the flesh. And we begin to overcome. Now, the grace of God doesn't cover us if we merely continue in our sins. We must repent and put them away now. Or we run the risk of utter ruin for the tidal wave of deception that is coming will sweep away all of the lukewarm. And they won't know what has happened to them. No, we want to be among the number that are being called and fulfilled, who've been justified and are now being sanctified, that we may become holy. And he says, I, Estrus, saw upon the mountain of Zion a great company of people who I could not number, and they all praised the Lord with songs. God's been impressing upon me to tell you to include praise and worship in your intercessory prayer times, a lot of people are anxious and praying out of a spirit of anxiety, a spirit of fear, and perfect love will cast out fear, and the perfect peace of God will keep you from the terror that is about to consume the people of this world. Everything that they believe in is about to fail them. Everything they hoped for is going to vanish like a mirage. And they will only see darkness and gloom upon the earth. The only people that can walk in this time are the people who know their God 
and who can enter his presence. So we enter the presence of the Lord with thanksgiving. We enter his courts with praise and our spiritual warfare is mixed with songs of deliverance. Hallelujah. Esther chapter six. Behold, the days will come and will begin to draw nigh when the Lord will visit those that dwell upon the earth and will begin to make an inquisition of them for what they've done in hurting and unjustly persecuting my righteous, when the afflictions of Zion shall be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters who are of the remnant, who've walked the path of affliction, who've been despised by the many, who've literally drank the same portion, the same cup that was given to the master when he walked among us as a man. He was a man of sorrows, rejected and afflicted. We despised him. The people despised him. Jesus suffered many things. He told the disciples, the son of man must suffer many things. This was hidden from their eyes. They didn't know what he's talking about. He explained it in part quite clearly. He said, I must be rejected by the chief priests and the elders and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they will hate me. They're going to persecute me. They're ultimately going to kill me, and I'm going to die but I'll be raised from the dead. And the scripture says they didn't understand what he was talking about because they were too preoccupied with something else that was on their mind. Which one of them was going to be the greatest? I think how the Lord must have felt. But when he told them the son of man must suffer many things, he was actually referring to his entire life. He was talking about when he was young, how he was ostracized because everyone knew Mary had given birth within months of her wedding to Joseph. Jesus was not born out of wedlock. He wasn't born a year after the marriage. Therefore, in the eyes of the religious community, He would have been viewed as a bastard son, which under the old covenant Torah is the worst curse you could come under. So the Lord his entire childhood and even adult years before he began his ministry in the eyes of many in his own hometown, even his own synagogue would have viewed him as a second class citizen one who had a mark of a curse unto 10 generations, but the Lord was blessed. They judged him wrongfully. He was conceived without sin because his father was God almighty. And he himself is the king of kings who came into the earth as a man, but in the most humble of all ways and in the eyes of his fellow countrymen, in their eyes, he came under shame. So too in the remnant, many, many have been persecuted wrongfully, judged for things they didn't even do. And so our eyes will be open soon and the affliction of Zion shall be fulfilled and the cup of affliction will be taken out of our hand and the cup of rejoicing will be given to the remnant. And the cup of affliction will be given to our tormentors. And when the world that shall begin to vanish away, shall be finished. The books shall be opened, and they will all see together. Hallelujah. And suddenly the sown land will appear unsown, and the full storehouses shall suddenly be found empty. The grocery stores will be empty. The gasoline, gone. The food stores, suddenly disappearing. Even the fields that would normally be full of crops shall suddenly die from drought and thirst. The pasture will appear desolate. The trees, the branches will die. The trumpet shall sound. The trumpet of war shall sound. And the trumpet of judgment shall be heard in the land. And then all of the nations shall be suddenly afraid. And at that time, friends will fight one another. Families will become like enemies and the earth will stand in fear. And those that dwell in will tremble and shake. And the springs of the fountains shall dry up and the mountains shall tremble. And whosoever remains after all of these, they will escape. After all of these judgments come into the earth, Those that remain, Yathar, 
the remnant, to leave a righteous remnant, those that shall escape will see my salvation and the end of the world. And the men that have received this truth shall see it, who have not tasted death from their birth, and the heart, the heart of the inhabitants shall be changed, and evil shall be put out, and deceit shall end, and for faith it shall flourish. Corruption shall be overcome, and the truth shall be lifted up, which has been for so long without fruit, yet shall now be declared. That is what is now taking place. Is it not amazing? It is astonishing. It's a wonder to behold it with your eyes. For indeed, the day of the Lord has come, even as it was prophesied in the scriptures of truth. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. I think I went a little longer than I expected. Um, I'm hoping to do a message every day as we count down the balance of the Omer. Thank you guys for listening. Keep me in your prayers. We are really on the front line now. And um, more to come. God bless you all. I pray the Lord would grant you the mercy and the grace and the faith to have the courage to obey God with all of your heart and to seek his face with all your might. Shalom.